Hey everyone, so good to see everyone. Just wanted to welcome everyone once again. My name is Eric Bucci and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church and this is your first time here. We want to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. We also want everyone to know that's home or watching online that we love them and we miss them. Can we give a big, come on, nice and loud. Welcome those that are home right now, wherever you're located, letting you know how important you are to God. We're in the middle of a series called Jonah a very uh, appropriate uh, thing we're going through right now. You think about what's going on in our culture, the message of Jonah, it really speaks to what we're all going through. And so Jonah is a book of the Bible. He was around during Jeroboam II uh, in the Old Testament. And he was uh, a great prophet, a prophet that was told to go to a city by the name of Nineveh. Nineveh was the uh, Assyrian's capital city kind of where Mosul is today and Iraq. It, is a, it was an incredible, incredible city, also an incredible, wicked city as well, a horrible city. In fact, what they used to do, if they, collect, if they came into a town, they would kill everybody, women and children, and they cut off your limbs and march you through a town. They'd pluck out your eyes. They would skin people alive and throw their skins on the wall. This is the kind of people they were. They'd make pyramids of heads. Pastor, why are you saying such horrible things? Because that's the kind of people they were. You think ISIS is bad. I mean, they would decapitate people. Horrible. Horrible. And they were the strongest military might people were very afraid of them. And God's people, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, they persecuted them. There was a commander by the name of Sennacherib. You might have heard of him in the scripture. Not snacking on a rib, but Sennacherib. And uh, I mean, it was bad. And so the Jewish people did not like the Ninevites. They were wicked, horrible city. It was the epicenter of it all. And God calls a prophet by the name of Jonah. He says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and because this, this come up to me, their wickedness. He's like, he doesn't say anything to God, but what he does is he runs. He does not want to go to Nineveh. Now, we wonder why. One reason is, I believe, it's quite clear that it's, they are such a wicked people, he's probably afraid. I mean, imagine being sent to Afghanistan and going to the Taliban. My brother Glenn was uh, working in the Twin Towers on 9-11, 2001, and uh, he actually saw, heard the plane, saw the planes crash into the towers. He knows people that died. By God's grace, he got out. Others did not. And so it would be like telling my brother Glenn, oh, Glenn, by the way, after this happened, I want you to go to uh, Afghanistan. I want you to find Osama bin Laden. We know where he is. And tell me Jesus loves him. I'll tell you one thing he wants to do is get a bazooka and say, Jesus loves you, and blow him to oblivion. That's the natural response of what you'd want to do. We all felt that way. Remember, if you were alive, you remember how we felt? Horrible what happened, right? It was terrible. So he hated, they hated the Ninevites. And so Jonah ran. Instead of going about 500 miles away, which about to be a week of walking, he decided to take a ship to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, about 30 miles away, and, and hired a ship and began to go the opposite direction to the furthest place he could go, 2,500 miles away. Now, how many of you are running from what God's called you to do? Maybe God's called you to forgive somebody, your ex-wife, your ex Husband, maybe you went through an abortion and you feel so guilty and God's saying, it's okay, I forgive you. Uh, no, God can't use me. Maybe you're running from a secret sin and you don't want God to talk. You see, you run the opposite direction. But the reason why Jonah ran is because of this. This is what he said. Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? In chapter 4, he tells the reason why he ran. That is why I made haste to flee. Why? For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. In other words, God's default setting is the forgiveness of sins and restoration to people. He does not want to damn people. He wants to save people, and Jonah knew that. 
You see, God's the same God in the Old Testament as the New Testament. Well, why is there so much? Because God gives warnings for hundreds and hundreds of years. We read a couple of verses, and a couple hundred years go by, or decades go by. And so God is warning. He does not want to see this country go through this. And so what happens is he gets on the ship. He goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the ship. He sleeps. He is slumbering. All of a sudden, God sends a tremendous storm. And the mariners, the, the people, the people that he hired to take care of the, of the boat, this, the seamen, they were very, very afraid what was happening. They said, this is not a normal storm. This is a supernatural storm. And so they're freaking out. They're calling on their false gods. And they say, where's this guy Jonah? They go to the bottom. He is fast asleep, binging on sleep. He's so tired, he doesn't even know what's going on. Have you noticed that the world's in a storm right now? Have you noticed for the first time in over 100 years, we have the entire planet, even in the Amazon rainforest, people are getting COVID. COVID is around the world. It's shut down the economy. You can see what's happening, right? Is God trying to wake us up? What about the political vitriol going on? What about the fighting and rioting in the streets and people being thrown on the ground and blood being poured out? I mean, like I saw yesterday, what's going on with such violence in the street? What's going on with this? What's wrong with our culture? And are we sleeping, everybody? Well, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. Is God trying to wake up not just America, but is he trying to wake up the world? Is the storms we're going through right now a result of that? I don't know exactly, but I believe God wants to get our attention. But are we like Jonah, asleep? Asleep. Are we sleeping on our phones, hypnotized, looking at this all day long? Are we drunk with news? And all worked up over the political things that are going on. Are we all so involved with what's going on in the world? Are we binge-watching um, binge Netflix? Are we constantly on Instagram and Twitter, constantly trying to live a life of trying to let people know you're okay? Are we so drunk with entertainment and bitterness and partisan politics? I hate those people. I hate them. Is that what we're going through right now? I wonder. And the world is looking for answers. Instead of looking to God, they look to government to solve their problems. Government can't solve their problems. We make government a God. And so the world is watching. The world is like, wake up. Where's our, what's going on here? And God is calling the church to be the spokespeople for this. And so they woke him up. Through casting lots, they realize it was him. He says, go ahead, just throw me in the sea. He was basically suicidal. He said, uh, just throw me in the sea. He didn't have the courage to do it himself. He said, you kill me. I can't kill myself. So they tried to row away. They didn't want to do it. They were calling on God. They were more righteous than Jonah was at that time. They pick him up. They didn't want to do it. They threw him into the sea. And all like that, boom, the storm stopped. Very much like what happened to Jesus when he spoke to the storm when the disciples were afraid. When Jesus was sleeping in the boat. And it was clear. The men worshiped God. And then Jonah went into the water. As you heard from last week. I always want to show you a little clip of actually how this can happen. Can you show that little clip real quick? You're going to see a whale in a few moments. These guys are kayaking. Check this out. You can see it. Watch this. Okay. So next time you go kayaking in the ocean, think about that. So it wasn't uncommon for this to happen. And this does, I mean, it's not common, but it does happen. They've cut open whales and they found human remains. People have been swallowed up in a whale. The acid is so great it can kill you and burn you and blind you. There's a story of a man that got out of it that, but had not been able to verify it in the 1800s. Came out blind as a result of it. They cut him open. He got, I don't know if it's true or not, and there's a lot of uh, debate about that. But the truth of the matter is that if you go in a whale, you could die from the, the gastric juices alone. And so last week, Pastor Rich talked about when he was sinking to the bottom of the ocean. He says, see all, the place of the dead, that he cried out to God. Jesus said this about Jonah. 
as it was with Jonah, so it will be the Son of Man. I will be three days in the earth and come back. So this, this is what happened. I believe, personally, I believe, I believe Jonah died in that fish. And I believe God resurrected him again. So it's not just an illustration. It's something that actually happened to everybody. The way it's written, it's not folklore. It's not Johnny Appleseed. It's not Paul Bunyan. It's the real, this really happened to him. Now, did, could God do that? Listen, if God could raise Jesus from the dead, if God could raise Lazarus from the dead, if God could raise others from the dead and do great miracles, why couldn't he do this? So what happened was, next thing we know, the great fish vomits him up. Maybe you feel like you've been vomited up on the beach of life. Maybe you feel like you stink. <laughs> Behold, he stinketh. As it says in the Bible, when uh, Lazarus uh, is in the tomb. So here you are, you're vomited up. I mean, everything you went through in your life, you thought you were going to run God. I guess God's done with me now. I guess I'm nothing but vomit. And maybe you feel that way. Maybe because of that divorce. Maybe because you tried so hard in school, you weren't able to get the college you were supposed to get into. Maybe you had friends and you lost them. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you were molested as a little boy or a girl. Maybe you were the molestor. And you just... I'm done. My life's over. I'm just vomited up on the beach. There's no hope for me. Think about how Jonah was. You know, it's so interesting that when he's vomited on the beach, something happens. Very interesting. God can use your pain and to use it to bring his kingdom forward. You know, it's so interesting because God wanted Jonah to go straight to Nineveh. He could have done that and avoided the fish, avoided the storm. But because he disobeyed, he went through that. But God took the consequences of that disobedience and used it as a tool. So you may have gone through an abortion, but maybe God can use you to encourage women. Maybe you were a part of it. Maybe you went through uh, the loss of somebody. Maybe you went through a horrible divorce and now you can help others get to the other side of it. Maybe you were abused and you come to the other side. Maybe you're a former drug addict. Maybe whatever you've been through, it wasn't what God wanted. But Matt, it says in Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good. He doesn't cause them, but he can work. He can take your pain and make it a gain for somebody. What the enemy meant for evil, God can redeem. He's the great miracle worker. So how interesting is that, that the Assyrians, Ninevites, worshipped a fish god. What an ugly mermaid. I mean, can you imagine you saw that? I'd, I'd, I'd scream. I hit with an ugly stick. I mean, that's an ugly mermaid. So think about it, a fish man. So what happens to Jonah? Now, he had to travel some time after getting back from the beach. But chances are, he was probably bleached white, probably lost all of his hair. That's why it's more godly not to have hair. I'm very proud of what I'm sporting back here. I have a skin yarmulke in honor of my Jewish friends. But here's Jonah, probably bleached, White, stinks, but he has to get himself clean, goes to, I mean, think about it. <laughs> He's in the Middle East. You know, they don't, have, they don't have white skin like that. They're more olive and tan with the sun. Here's a pure, ugly white guy. <laughs> don't get offended by what I just said. But he was bleached white. So he come, here's this guy coming and talking to people. Do you think maybe they got their attention? And he probably told them the story. Of what happened. Well, let's can move on and see what happens. It's very interesting the book of Jonah is, is broken into two sections. They kind of reflect each other. It's very interesting. If you look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying. So God calls him for a mission. Then he gets swallowed by the fish, burped up on the beach, thrown up on the beach. And then in Jonah 3, 1, we see that it happens again. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And with a new command. Isn't it amazing? I don't know about you, but I would have disqualified Jonah. Maybe some of you feel disqualified. I'm done. I'm never going to be worth anything anymore. Why would God want to use me? 
What do I have to offer after all I've been through? Really? You know, God is the God of the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. God can work through anybody who is surrendered to him and believes in him. God can use you despite your past, no matter what you've been through. Don't count yourself out because God hasn't. If you have breath in your lungs and you are breathing today, God has a purpose and he has a plan for you. And today we have growth track at 1 o'clock. I want to encourage you to go to that. Where we actually you can do on Zoom or go in person. We want to help you to get connected so you can be a part of what God is doing. God's not done. God's not done with Jonah. God's not done with you. Let me see Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. What happens here? Not only that, it shows how he ran. Now he called him. Now he runs. But Jonah rose to flee Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he ran from the Lord. And Jonah 1, 3, and Jonah 3, 3, he ran to the Lord's work. So here's the redemption of it all. And Jonah 1, 5, then the Mariners, those are the people that, not the baseball team, let me make that clear, the guys that are working on the, on the sailboat, they were afraid, each cried of them cried out to God, and they gave their life to God. They gave their life to the Hebrew God. They got saved, in other words. Well, and Jonah 3, 5, and the people of Nineveh believed God. So there's parallels between these two things. Very interesting. So it's all about the second chance. You see, God doesn't just pass you on to the next grade so you can graduate with your friends. If you can't do the, the, the coursework, you'll repeat it. And you'll get left back and left back and left back. And you'll go on and on and on. And you'll take the same test. Maybe it's some, some of you where you're at. Why do I keep tripping over the same thing? I'm in a vicious cycle. Maybe it's time to listen to God finally and break the vicious cycle. And this is what God gave him an opportunity. Now we come to our passage today. It's just 10 verses. Jonah chapter three. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, arise and go to Nineveh. Remember, Nineveh is a city that is very large, has 100 foot high walls. This is about 20 feet. Imagine four times this. That's pretty high. It was so wide that three chariots could race across. We talked about what kind of city it was. It was an amazing city. One of the most amazing cities in the world at the time. It was probably a natural wonder. So the word of the Lord came a second time saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Call out against it. In other words, tell them that destruction is coming. Call out against it the message I tell you. You think God has given us a message? Do you think maybe the world needs to know? Do you know what? Can you see the storm raging in our country right now, in our world? What is God calling us to do? Are we sleeping in the bow of the ship? Our God has told us to go. Are we staying? You see, God is the great, God is the God of forgiveness and can use you despite your past no matter what you've been to, been through god can use you don't count yourself out because god has not counted you out or you wouldn't be alive the fact that you are alive there's an opportunity so what happened verse three so jonah arose he finally went he went to nineveh according to the word of the lord are we going to the word world according to the word of God. You see, your world may be working at a dentist's office. Your world may be being a doctor at an office. Your world may be a stockbroker. Your world may be a stay-at-home mom or dad. Your world might be retired. God has put you in a place. He sent you to that world. That is your mission field, and your job and my job is to spread that news to people. It's not just for the pastors and evangelists. So Jonah arose. He went to Nineveh. According to the word of the Lord. Now, when Nineveh was an exceeding great city, three days' journey, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, five, a real quick sermon, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In other words, you're going to be destroyed because of your wickedness. He probably told them, I was in the belly of a fish. He probably told them that as well. And began to say all the wicked things they did. He probably enjoyed himself. He's one of those angry preachers that wanted everyone that he was preaching to go to hell. To me, it's encouraging that God's word does not return void. The Bible even says, the Apostle Paul says, some people preach God, Jesus, out of 
out of motivations for greed. But at least the word, at least it's getting out. See, the word of God is strong. And so this is what happened. He called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So our role is to share, and God's role is to save. It's not my, I can't save anybody. You see, this is the problem. If I think it's all up to me, good luck. So someone says, Pastor, that was a great sermon. I'm like, I'm just preaching the gospel. If I take it, I, mean, I appreciate the encouragement, but if, I, if that's what I live for, good luck. So if I share the word of God with someone and they don't accept it, I'm not going to feel like it's my fault. And if they accept it, it's not, it's not my fault either. It's the word of God working. I did my part by sharing. Your job is to spread the news. Let the consequences happen. You are a male man or a male woman. You're like one of those bike de paper delivery people. Just throw the paper. The paper will take care of it. God's word does not return void. We don't have to make it work. It works. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Penetrating between spirit and flesh goes down to the very marrow of the bone. It is sharper. It is strong. God's word is fine. You just deliver it. You're like an Amazon driver. Our role is to share, and God's role is to save. Put the pressure on him. God, I've done my job. That's what we should do. And the people of Nineveh believed God. You know, I, I really do believe this. The hardest people to reach is the church. The hardest people to reach are people that think they have it all together. The hardest people to reach are sometimes the church. The, Jesus got the most difficult people he dealt with was not the prostitutes, was not the Romans officials. It was the church people. And the people of Nineveh believed God. Why? Because he preached the gospel. Are we preaching the gospel? Well, Jesus wants you to have, he wants you to be happy. You give your life to Jesus and you'll have that new car. Give your life to Jesus, go on vacation. Give your life to Jesus and you can actually live the life that you pretend to do on Instagram. Go ahead, give your life to Jesus. You'll be happy. You'll be joyful. I gave my life to Jesus. I'm so happy. Jesus did not die for your happiness. He died for your wholeness. Why? Because you're on a collision course to a place called hell. A place that was not designed for you or I. Destruction. And everyone knows it deep inside that they're separated from God. There's a place called hell. And so if we just tell people, oh, Jesus just wants to save you so you can have a good life. No, he's saving people because there is a place called hell. And if you just think, imagine this, everybody. I heard this a number of years ago. Imagine that someone gives you a parachute, you go on a plane, and you have to wear this parachute. You're like, you said this is going to make my, my flight better? I said, my flight's not better at all. I, I, could barely, I can't even put the tray table down. Why, am, why do I have this parachute? Because, well, you know, it, makes you feel, it makes you enjoy the journey more when you're in an airplane. And you're like, this stinks. I'm getting off the plane. But if you know the parachute's there, that when the plane goes down, you can jump out and be saved, that parachute has a different meaning. So it's, it's wrong for us to say, just give your life to Jesus. Have your best life now. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. It's all about your prosperity. It's all about your political candidate. No. There's a place called hell. God loves. He doesn't want you to go there. So what happened? And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast. And they put on sackcloth, like a potato sack. Really, really uncomfortable stuff. You put it on yourself to remind you to mourn. And they didn't eat. They fast. From the greatest of them to the least of them. That means they got it. Everyone got it. Think about that. The Bible says that. The word reached the king of Nineveh. The king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne. He literally got off his throne and removed his robe. He says, I'm getting off my power seat. Are you willing to get off your throne, your rulership? Your, it's my life. I can do what I want to do. I'm like Frank Sinatra. It's my life. Or Bon Jovi. It's my life. Whatever. And you, I'm, I'm sorry, it's Generation X, and I'm talking about the baby boom generation. That's beside the point. Let's move forward. Are you willing to get off your throne? He took his robes of splendor. 
his uniform of power. And he took it off and he put on sackcloth like everyone else. And he sat, he went from a throne to sitting in ashes. You know, the Bible says this, none is righteous, no, not no one. Do you realize you're a wreck? Look at your neighbor and say, you're a wreck. Say, call a wrecker. <laughs> the truth is, God's come to save us, everybody. We're all, we're, none is righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. We're, it's wonderful news. We all blow it. We're all horrible without God. That means no one can say I'm better than anybody else. What a beautiful thing that is. But through Christ, we are accepted not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done and that we've given ourselves to that. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. Then the king, what did the king do next? And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. Are we publishing a proclamation? By the decrees of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let not them feed or drink water. Even their animals fasted. If you ever fast, you can fast, you can fast your animals. Not the dog, but the cat. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Not only do you not feed, they even put sackcloth on the, on the animals. And let them call it a mighty God. They actually put on dog sweaters. Can you imagine that? So, I mean, look at I mean, the dog should get a sweater. The cat got sackcloth, okay? <laughs> so even the animals... And even the animals are, are fasting and praying. And God, at the end of the Bible, the book says, I, I love the animals too. Yeah, I care about the animals. God cares about animals. So, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mighty to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way. Turn means turn away from what you're doing is wrong. Don't just acknowledge you're doing it wrong, but turn away from it and change the, your mind about it. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence... That is in his hands. Do you see the violence in our culture? Hello. It shows how wicked we've become. And we're supposed to call out against the violence. Who knows? The king says. God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger. Maybe God will relent and bring peace to our country. Peace to our home. Peace to our world. So that we may not perish when God saw what they what faith without works is dead when he saw what they did how they turned from their evil way God relented God changed his mind God can change his mind about America God can give grace to our country. God can give grace to this world. I believe. You can see what's happening. The, the table's being set. One world government. All these things are beginning to happen. But it, could it be that if we, the church, would get our act together and repent from our sins, which we'll share in a few moments, maybe the message would get out. And I have a sneaky suspicion that the world is a lot more apt to hear our voices than it is for us to hear God's voice. But we get in the way because we think we're better than they are. No, we're not better. It's only by God's grace we're better. We're better only because we've taken advantage of the situation. We're not better as people. You see, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So God sends us to avoid him sending judgment. Do you realize that? We are couriers of grace. Are you and I willing to speak the word? Let the words be spoken. God will take care of his words and ask the worship team to make the way. God will make it happen. You don't have to do it yourself. You know what it said in Ezekiel 22, 30? And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Do you realize God's looking for men and women? He chooses, he chooses.
to spread his word through us. How can they be saved unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. We're called to preach the gospel. Yes, with words. I heard people say, well, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. I understand that what that means, but just having a good lifestyle is not enough. You have to speak the words and live the words as well. You see, that's the first thing. And God is calling you for a relationship and purpose that begins with repentance. All of us, whether you've given your life to Christ or not, God's calling you to a relationship with repentance. He's calling you for a mission. You're not here by yourself for no reason. God has you on the earth for a reason. He, he wants to work with you. What a privilege it is to work for God, to work with God. It's the most wonderful thing. That's why we have a dream team. That's why we encourage you to get involved. This coming Saturday, we're going to be reaching out to our community. Handing out groceries to people that are, are less fortunate through this holiday season. This is why we're asking you to bring groceries. We want to reach out. We want to be God's hands. We want to be his feet. That's why we have missionaries. This is why we do what we do. We want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are the couriers. The Bible says this. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Have you done that, everybody? Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. God is stronger than the devil. The Bible says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. He's talking to the to believers. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's talking to the church of his day. James is saying, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn. What? And weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. What kind of message is that? That's not what I heard. I believe God is calling our church to mourn and weep. How do we do that? It's a choice you and I make. What? Yes. We should weep for our country. We should care for our country. We should care for our loved ones. I have no desire. I don't care. I know that. It's a choice we can make. And I'm asking God how we can do that. The fast. To mourn for our own sins, how we've blown it. To mourn how we treated different ethnicities in our country. To mourn how we treated people who look different than us or vote different than us. To mourn for how we have been arrogant. To mourn for the sin that we do. Not forgiving our neighbors. Not forgiving our spouse. Not forgiving our parents. Not forgiving your employee or employees. Be wretched and mourn. Weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. Stop exalting your own opinion. I have to stop exalting my opinion. Exalt the Lord. Humble yourself. Let God exalt you. You don't have to be a self-made man. God will make you self God will make you a godly woman or a godly man don't make yourself that person and he will exalt you and listen to this and do not speak evil against one another you never hear that part how are you speaking about other people indicates your heart how are you speaking to people who don't believe how are you speaking to those on the different side of the aisle how are you speaking to that person that hurts you you see, it's a promise in Scripture. I don't believe God's asking us to save the world, that that's what he wants us to do. But judgment begins in the house of the Lord. If we're going to be representatives of him, Jonah had to get it right in the whale. He repented in the whale. Are you going to repent? Or are you going to let your life swallow you up? If my people who are called by my name will humble, just like the king, just like the king, in Nineveh, he humbled himself, humbled themselves, and pray, and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways like the Ninevites did. Then I will hear from heaven, 
I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Jericho was healed. It had a death sentence. I believe America has a death sentence on it. And we need to speak the truth of God wherever God places you. But first, are you an arrogant Christian? Am I an arrogant Christian? Am I a prideful Christian? Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. See, this is what it says, everybody. So my, my first question to you today is this. Are you right with God in this regard? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. Let's just pray right now. Father, forgive us. We who are believers, forgive us for being pompous. Forgive us for being arrogant, God. Forgive us for having a heart of Jonah who hate people who are different and don't believe like we believe. Forgive us, Father, for doing the very same things the world does. Forgive us for letting our anger and frustration and indifference and apathy, having no, but being all about ourselves. Lord, break our heart for what breaks yours. Move in our hearts, oh God. Lord, show us different ways we can turn from our sin, God. That you'd have mercy upon our country. And Father, it starts with us. We don't look to them, for we looked at us first in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that we would share your, share your word and let you deal with the consequences. Thank you. It's not our job. Our job is to give the full counsel of your word, and you will do the rest in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you all, everyone else who doesn't know God, repent, therefore, in all of us, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing. You see, yeah, God gives you a better life. Absolutely. To know that your sins are forgiven, that your yesterdays are, are clean, and that you'll be with him forever. That's why I always tell people the best days are always ahead for Christ Jesus. Why? Because we have times of refreshing. Know that Christ has paid the price. May come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed to you. For God, we know this verse, but I'm going to say it in the most important verse, I believe, that it summarizes it all. For God so loved the world, it's like he loved Jericho, that he gave his only son. He gave a Jonah. He gave Jesus that whoever believes, doesn't make a difference who you are, how old you are, how young you are, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Remember, that's not our job. He wants to save the world in order that the world might be saved through him. Guys, you don't have to get your act together. You have to get your surrender together. You finally have to be like the king of Jericho. Get off your throne. Take off all your, uh, who you think you are and submit it and God will forgive you. God will save you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads once again, everybody, even at home. And we're going to pray a prayer. If you want to give your life to Christ for the very first time, I'm going to ask those here. If you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you did it one time and you turned away, you want to get right, just show me your, just show me your hand real quick so I can see it. Be, be bold. Be bold online as well. You just say, I want to give my life to Christ today. Go ahead. I'm giving my life to Jesus today. Right online. Anyone here this morning? Okay, let's pray this prayer together in our hearts. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to follow you all the days of my life. I hand over my life to you. It's not my life. It's yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved. You're on your way to heaven. You need to follow Jesus. It's a journey. We want to help you along the way. There are connection cards, cards in front of you. Pull them out. If you're in the front row, you reach behind you. There are cards. If you could just fill that out. If you're online, you can do this as well. You can text BEGIN to 94090. You can text BEGIN to 94090. And we'll send you a Bible if you want one. We'll send you a Bible. We'll help you the next steps. And you can do this today. Fill this out, everybody. God's got good plans. We want to help each other become what God's called us to become. As we continue to worship God, 
You don't have to give what you get to give. If you're a first-time guest, don't feel obligated, but you can. And there's four ways to give. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire to 77977. You can see it up there. You can uh, push pay app, which you can download later on. You can go to our website. You can send it by mail. Or today, as you walk out of those boxes, it says offering and connection card. You can put it in there as well. I want to thank you for trusting God. Listen, I have no apologies. I, you want to get through this economic downturn. Trust God with what he's given you. Watch him multiply. I'm telling you, it works. If you give it to the Lord, you tithe 10%. You give it to the Lord. You trust God with his work to the local storehouse, which is the church you go. Watch how God will take care of you. I have no apologies. I, I would tell you, even if I wasn't the pastor of the church, it works. I'm telling you. Trust God and watch what he'll do. He will supply all of your needs in Christ Jesus. And so that's what's happening. Hey, listen, everybody. Thank you so much for your attention today. Thank you so much for watching online as well. We appreciate you. You mean a lot to God. God loves you. And we have good plans for today. Uh, at 1 o'clock, there is Growth Track Step 3, what it means to be a leader. And everyone's a leader in one step or other. We want to encourage you as you walk out of here today. You can call the office, by the way, if you'd like to, and pick up a bag to fill it with groceries. We want to bless as many people as we can this coming Friday, a Saturday. God bless you guys, and let the Lord Jesus Christ fill you with his peace, his joy, his forgiveness, and his perfect plan in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Have an amazing day.